It's time. Highlighting Christianity with your host, Dr. William T. Greer, Jr. Welcome to It's Time. My name is Bill Greer, and I'm your host at this particular moment. And my concern is to address a particular subject that is certainly one that I think is needful uh, in Christendom today. And that is the church in crises is what I want to just present. I've been in the ministry about 50 years now, and I've served in various areas, pastoring, teaching on all levels, institutes, seminaries. I've also served as a consultant across the country to churches and done workshops and seminars, and the concern was to cause the church to come back to that which Jesus began both to do and teach. And so I find, well, I want to just share this with you, that a major concern <clears throat> or a major cause of the church not being effective today, or we also phrase as the apostasy, the fall away from the faith, as we predicted in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Apostle Paul said to Timothy to preach the word, uh, be instant in season, out of season, to rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And any of you scholars know in the Greek word healthy, it means here again healthy. But they will turn their ears away from the truth and they will accumulate to themselves teachers because of their itching ears, they want what they want to hear. In the Bible, they will turn to fables. And so that's the major cause of apostasy is also biblical illiteracy. The average Christian today uh, uh, does not find themselves reading their Bibles. And so my concern here is a need for church plants, new church plants. And, and God said back in the Old Testament here again, as he spoke with Hosea, Hosea sorry, the prophet, and he says, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. And here it doesn't mean that the knowledge was not there. They had uh, uh, the teachings of Moses and right down the line here again, but he says, they lack, and because, again, because why? And it tells you, because you have rejected knowledge, God says. And that is what has happened in our days and time. Knowledge is rejected. Not that knowledge is not there. And so there's a denial of God's word. And God says, well, in that case then, I will also reject uh, you as being priests for me. And so Christianity today is not effective in the way Jesus Christ intended for us to be. Because we reject knowledge, we are biblically illiterate. And so my concern is to challenge anyone out there who's concerned, again, to please the Lord and to follow after him, is that we must come back to that which Jesus began both to do and teach. The church is in crises. And so God says uh, also to Hosea, he said, it shall be like people like priests. Now that may sound strange to you. Well, what that means here again is that as the preacher is, so is the congregation. And this is what we have today. And so our congregations, again, uh, <clears throat> are like their pastors or their preachers. And with a good number of preachers today who no longer preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way the Bible says teach it and preach it, the church is in crisis. Unfortunately, today's church <clears throat> In crisis can be equated, listen now, can be equated with the Pharisaic attitude of Jewish leaders and the religion during the time of the Lord Jesus. In that, God says in Matthew uh, chapter 15, he talks with them about what has happened, which can again be equated with us today. And, and that the word or the reality of God is of none effect because of the traditions adopted. And boy, we can wanna talk about the number of traditions that we have adopted, the same as the Pharisees did, 
who added to the law of God, I think there were about over 700 additional kinds of laws they added. And the traditions made them comfortable and which certainly made the word of God of none effect. And therefore the church is in crisis. As I said from the top here again and again that the prediction is that the church would fall away from the faith and would give heed uh, you know, to demons, doctrines of demons. They would turn to fables. And so during the time of Christ when the Pharisee or the Pharisee uh, leaders, a ship, okay. Again, uh, decided that, well, hey, they're more, again, uh, knowledgeable than God in one sense. And add to God's law, Adagad's word, certainly is a warning uh, against that, as the Lord Jesus himself said. You don't add to his words, you don't take away. And so these things that happen, a combination with both back this time of Christ and in today's church, which is in crises. And so those leaders in that time here again describes many of today's uh, spiritual leaders who have been affected by the Pharisaic pride. It's just amazing with so much pride today and people pride, pride themselves as being Baptists and pride themselves as being Presbyterians and Episcopals and Pelians and Methodists. Well, all of these things here again bring confusion to the unbeliever. Because they say, well, who's right? Who do we follow? And as the Greeks came to the disciples in the scriptures on one occasion, they said, sir, we would see Jesus. And so it's very difficult to see Jesus in the way that Jesus presented himself today because the church is in crises. All right. And what has happened here again, that Pharisaic pride that has taken place among much leadership in our society today, uh, again, because you'll find this and you'll see this in the pursuit of titles, stature, building one's own prestige, and it has eliminated the idea of being continually the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who unite with today's traditional, unbiblical traditional churches are not trained to be disciples, but church members. And most do not have any idea of what biblical Christianity is. And I'm coming out of my experiences, ladies and gentlemen, of what I've experienced in the last 50 years in the church. Hard to believe how we have deviated from biblical Christianity. Too many of the day, the churches is gay, do not know what it means to follow Christ. That is to die to self. To have a born again experience. In fact, it results in, in becoming introverted and our churches are designed and our activities are designed to pacify uh, rather than become what we need to be uh, to the community at large who are lost and in need of a savior. And so what happens goes on this way and, and what has happened is that many Christians have become or believers or professing Christians have become what we classified as nominal. Nominal meaning that <clears throat> that is acting or being something in name only. Not again uh, in reality result again not in reality but a result in becoming introverted. You see, they define serving the Lord as being what well, I serve as a choir member. I serve as an usher or. Uh, I'm only a given auxiliary in my church. And, uh, but this, again, has become ministry uh, for the church today, many. Not all. We understand that. And what it does is overshadows the primary mission or the purpose of the church being here in the world. Now, I did a seminar for numbers of years on the mission of the church in the world, which has to do with what we are supposed to be about. We've been deviated from all of the things that Jesus Christ instructed us to do 
And therefore, that's why the church is in crises. You see. Well, this is a contrast to the early believers <coughs> who understood their mission and were empowered, notice, empowered by the Holy Spirit, demonstrating, demonstrating here again, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, brother, when I came to you, in fact, I want to turn there, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and tell you what Paul says which here again, that has been lost in today's church. And so give me a chance to turn there and I want to show it to you. I want to read it to you rather. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And read it from what Paul says when he came and how the Lord touched him. Well, Paul says there in that second chapter, he says, for I determined, this is he says, I determined with myself that I would not come again into you in heaven, for I make not here concerned to make you sorrowful. But his concern was that, listen now, my burden and my concern is, let me go back and take a look at it again, because I'm, I want you to be able to get exactly what Paul says when he talked with the Corinthian church. Notice what he says. And I, brother, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, listen now, or wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech, listen here, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Say but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what has happened today here again is that our churches today no longer comes and again and demonstrates the love for God, the love for people as you have love for one another. And so our concern here is that the church being in crisis cannot demonstrate it. We're not under the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a form of godliness, but no power. Well, this particular kind of uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in as the body of Christ, again, is, is very, very, very disturbing and I'm hoping I'm, I'm disturbing someone out here who will come to realize that we must return to that which Jesus began both to do and teach. Now the biblical model that we don't see too much again uh, is that when you go to the book of Acts, the chapter here again four, you'll find here the biblical model of the church functioning it says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that anything uh, that was this was his own, but they all had all things in common. And notice what it says, and with great power, that with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. But since, again, as the day being in crisis, the church, uh, the body of Christ have become fragmented, tribal, not one heart no more. Denominations, there are over 300 denominations uh, today around the world. And as I said a little earlier, the unbelievers said, well, who's right? Who do you believe? And so I think the church has caused more confusion as to the truth. We got every kind of variation. And so the Lord didn't design but one church, one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. So we're in crisis, ladies and gentlemen. My concern is, is, is to disturb. Here again. And then there are many times, there are many, many, in my experiences here again, I have had many uh, uh, what I consider nominal Christians who complain about 
well, uh, the fellowship they attend that, well, we don't, we don't do things uh, like we ought to do or whatever. And whenever I hear these complaints about any shortcomings related to where they are attending church, I hear the complaints, but they remain. They remain in that setting. And so not realizing they're, they're just as guilty as others and they contribute to the fall away from the faith. Well, you hear these kind of like, excuses where they say, well, I know our church is not perfect. And I totally agreed on that, <laughs> that we're flesh and numbers are perfect. But when we fall away from the faith and turn our uh, ways to fables, when we listen to doctrines of demons, when we become more emotional, when we uh, 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 look to our commentaries more than the Bible itself, when we have activities that keeps us introverted, keep us away from the primary purpose of making disciples for Jesus. Well, then here again, that is these excuses you cannot give to God. And none of them say, well, I know my church don't follow, well, as we ought to, uh, but I've been a member there for X number of years, and that's my mother's church, my father's church. Well, I, well they have one church, I told you, and that's the church that Jesus established. And the excuses go on and on and on. Well, I pay my tithe. Well, thank God you do, because most of them don't. <laughs> the average church member don't pay any tithe. And so here again, but I reiterate that, hey, how can you continue to be a disciple of Christ and remain in a setting that have turned away from the faith? That's the question you're going to have to settle in your own heart. See? You can't talk about here again because we're talking about self-sacrifice, sacrificing yourself, denying self. You don't see that anymore. Presenting your bodies, living sacrifices, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. All of these particular teachings are, are not, uh, again, uh, are given in our churches. Uh, we don't have Sunday schools no more. Prayer meetings have been cut out. It's amazing. And so the church is in crisis. Well, let me go ahead and find it here again. That I, how can you continue to be a disciple of Christ and remain in a setting that's not pleasing to Christ? And again, we're not talking about being absolutely perfect. We are none of us perfect. And so I'm sure you got what I'm trying to say to you. And your complaints here again, you acknowledge the truth of God by complaining that things are not right. Every Christian will be held accountable. Every professing Christian who say they are Christians again will be held accountable for denying their faith by any complacent attitude, any kind of an attitude that dismisses you or, again, complacent in one sense, okay? There's no excuse in falling Christ. And so <clears throat> your refusal to act according to the scriptures is inexcusable. And so we have no right to an opinion. That's another thing that can happen. Well, this is what I think. This is what I believe. No, it's what God says, not what you think. It's what God says. Uh, you can't, you couldn't save yourself. If you got saved, you were born again by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to read that for you as well. So to make you aware that is a thing didn't come from you, the thing of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are, you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your mind, body rather, and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't belong to you. You don't, you don't have a right to an opinion. You were like a slave bought a slave market when you were in sin and Jesus came and purchased you with his blood. And so you don't have, you, you can't give an excuse why you're not serving the Lord. It's amazing. Prayer, I meaning prayer, period. Christians only pray when they get in some sort of difficulty. And it's just amazing, like God, you can con God when you want to. You can just 
use God in the way you want to use God. It don't work that way. So the church is in, in crisis. But my challenge is, the challenge is to anyone here, it doesn't matter, is that the Bible, not my challenge, but the bi biblical challenge. Let me get that first. The biblical challenge here is this. When you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, this is what the Lord says. But we command you, brother, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw, that you withdraw, that you withdraw from every brother who walketh disorderly and not according to the traditions which uh, he, he received from us. And the Apostle Paul made that clear and the Holy Spirit inspired him to write that again is that withdraw yourself. You are responsible to follow Christ if there's a violation of his word. I don't care who we are, where we are, how close it is. It don't make any difference at all. My question comes, who in today's postmodern church culture would dare follow these commands? See? Or make such a commitment? But who would be willing to come under the Lordship of Christ? Who would be willing to be a living sacrifice as required? Again, God didn't bite his tongue. God knew what he's saying. Withdraw yourself. And what church member would love the Lord so much that they would surrender all to him? Again, who would be willing to commit to what Jesus began both to do and teach? So many of today's churches will not eliminate unbiblical traditions. No, listen why, because the Bible teaches this as well. When you look at Matthews, again, you go back, I'm sorry, you look at St. John, rather, where Jesus was, was dealing with the, some of these uh, uh, religious leaders and whatever. In John chapter 12, verse 42 for 43, what, look what happens here. Many, these are leaders now, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Talking about the Pharisaic leaders of Sanhedrin, all the group here again, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear, listen, here it is, for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. I've experienced this as a pastor 50 years. People here come and, 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 and uh, because they don't, they don't, they want to be sure that they're buried from their church. <laughs> if you're dead, you're dead. You see? But it's amazing. They would fear to be put out of the synagogue. And then it goes on to say, to drive home the point, listen here again, for they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Isn't this amazing? Boy, this is so true for our church today. We love the praises of men more than the praises of God. And what we're saying, listen, what we're saying by that is that Jesus Christ is not worth it. That's exactly what you're saying when you do not follow Christ. He's not worth it, you're saying. Isn't that amazing? You may not realize what you're saying. Any excuse, any attitude against the scripture teachings, the falling away from the faith, the turning to fables, listen to doctrines of demons, being comfortable, you're saying that, hey, I can't give this up for Jesus, and is he not worth it? But the challenge continues to come to anybody who wants Christ Jesus as Lord, as he's des he deserves. The church needs to regain its stature in Christ. There needs to emerge a fellowship of believers that would desire the reality of God, who would live out a relationship with him beyond pacifying traditions a fellowship of believers who would so commit themselves to Christ to become so dedicated to what Jesus began both to do and teach. So under the reign of the Holy Spirit, resulting again, listen, resulting again in attracting unbelievers, seekers, skeptics, scoffers, producing fulfillment and unspeakable joy, 
under these particular trying circumstances that we live in in this society today. God never designed for us to be the foot, but the head. He designed us here to make the impact that he made when he came to the earth. But that needs to be emerged today, the fellowship of believers that would desire God in all the ways that God designed, all the ways that God presented himself, all the way that God requires because he deserves it. So this is what we're saying to you. There needs to emerge the unique fellowship of believers who would not need to depend on the state. We get a number of churches again here again who become welfare mentality and they begin to beg for things from the, everybody else. And rather than give the tithes and offerings like God, God said in Deuteronomy, I made you the head, not the tail. God said, I take care of all of my, my bills. <laughs> all my obligations, God said, I can handle. But my people refuse to hear my voice. That's why the church is in crisis. We're out here begging people on the street for cup to come to our programs. Programs to keep the church doors open, to keep the heat on and all that. God didn't design all of this mess. We get deviated from what our purpose is. Get a big building and now we, we do, worrying about paying it off. God will give you a building if you build it up the way he designed it. And so we need to access, listen now, let me just read this to you. I'll finish reading this. There needs to emerge the unique fellowship of believers who would not need to depend on the state because the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. A weed and seed money program cannot stop crime. You, you can't stop an arsonist from burning down a building with a light bulb. You know, hey, it don't work that way. The problem is in the heart of a man. Say, and so here again, we need to assess our position in Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to assess our position in Christ. And Paul again says in 2 Corinthians 13, therefore examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. You see, I mean, test yourselves. You do that. You judge your own self. Examine yourself has to do with how much you are committed, dedicated to Jesus Christ. Not necessarily to your church where you have been a member for X number of years, but how involved are you in Christ? Okay. Understand what's at stake here. What's at stake here is carrying out the Great Commission. That's what's at stake here, what Jesus assigned us to do. And so there needs to be those who are willing to follow Christ at all costs. And so you might ask yourself some questions. How committed am I? Am I in the place where the Lord Christ wants me to be? If I lose my position in the church or don't have a position in the church, would I still follow Christ? Or does my life truly glorify God? Or what influence do my life have outside the church walls or beyond Sunday? These are questions you're going to have to consider. You see, the challenge goes on and on and on. I would take this up next time and continue to give the challenge to make you aware the reason we are in crisis in the church and why our families are coming apart, the reason why we don't see victories, the reason why we don't see healings, and why we don't have that which we need to have. And Satan's having a heyday over us. You wonder why we got the perverted lifestyles in the church. The church is in crisis because we have what? denied the knowledge of God. We have fallen away from the faith. I hope to get back to you again on this. If you want to say good day, good night, whatever time you're watching this program or whatever time you listen to this program. And so I hope you'll hear and we'll give information next time to how you can get in touch with us and that kind of thing and get some information from us. And thank you. Come on and make a new start. Our mission, to reaffirm the value of mankind, to restore hope by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are concerned to bring glory to our Savior by challenging the Christian community to team together in order to bring about biblical reconciliation, transformation of individuals, churches, and communities. It's Time is designed to challenge the minds of our time to reconsider, reevaluate any mindset that has not produced the needed results.